All right. Well, again, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started in the book of Genesis. I'll tell you what, I've been, I've been stuck in the garden for a few weeks, so I'm having, <laughs> I've been having, I'm, we're having one of those accidental series, so we'll just kind of give you a heads up here. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, Look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given you every green plant as food for all the wild animals, for food for all the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Genesis 2, these are just a few excerpts, kind of a few pre-fall excerpts here, and then we'll kind of fast forward there. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit, In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Out of the ground, the Lord Lord formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see if what he would and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the this is kind of fast forwarding a little bit now. They heard the sound of the Lord, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. All right, we kind of know the rest of the story. We kind of talked about the rest of the story a few weeks ago, but I just really want to look at some things leading up to that point we know happened. We see that Adam and Eve had a relationship with God. In fact, he, he's speaking to him. And in verse, you know, uh, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, this is the first Bible. He gives them the first word of God. You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. That was the whole Bible in the Garden of Eden. That was really, that's all they had to do. Just that one thing, Right? It's funny. It reminds me, I saw somebody post a, a comical little cartoon at the, at the early part of the, when the pandemic set in and said, you mean we can save the world if we just stay home, watch TV, and eat junk food? <laughs> says, Come on, guys, let's not mess this up, you know. That was, that was kind of the, of course, we know it was a little more complicated than that, but when we look at this, they just had one instruction. They did. I mean, if they had just done this one thing, the world wouldn't have needed saving in the first place. This one thing, the whole Bible right here. But we see there's dialogue. They haven't fallen. God's just talking with them. He's telling them this. In fact, we see this amazing little sub-story in the creation of of the animals and the birds and all that stuff. And uh, you'd see that God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air. And look at this, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds. God didn't give the names to them. Adam did. Not because God couldn't, but because he chose for man to do that. Isn't that an amazing thought? That he gave us a part to play in creation? You know, naming the animals, that was our job. That's what we did. What does that show, though? It shows fellowship. This is pre-fall stuff. This shows hanging out with God. This shows dialogue. What are you going to call that one, Adam? 
That's his name. That's pretty special. It shows something. And then also, you kind of see that um, when Adam and Eve could see or could tell, hear the sound, it says in verse 8, of the Lord walking in the garden. Obviously, it's a sound they heard before. This is a sound they're familiar with. It wasn't like, what's that? Oh, it's God. You know, it's, it's a sound they knew and they ran. Because we know they ate the fruit. They did what they weren't supposed to do. It brought the shame, the guilt, and they ran. They ran. I mean, how many times do we say, we want the presence of God? Well, they hid themselves from the presence of God. Why is it that sometimes we want the presence of God and other times we want to run from the presence of God? There's something. There's something that that pivots on. And we see that here with, with Adam and Eve. When they ate, their conscience were violated. That shame, that guilt. You're not wanting the presence of God. You're running from the presence of God. When your conscience is clear, I want more. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness. But it's all pivoting on that one thing. That your conscience. That's why the blood of Jesus is so important. We talked about it this morning. You know, if we just had a forgiveness religion, you forgave your sins, but you still felt guilt and shame, you're right back to the garden where Adam fell. The blood's got to do something more than just do some accounting. It's got to restore something. You know, when you look at this, this picture of Adam and Eve in the garden, you look at they had this amazing thing with God. They were hanging out with him, co-laboring with him, whatever they were doing in garden stuff. It's an amazing existence. Have they not fallen? Mankind, now obviously the Lord knew they were going to fall. Christ is a slain from, lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But had you know, man not fallen, they would have been born into this garden paradise. Of course, we're born into a sinful world. But the good news is, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we can be born again. And we can be born again to that garden walk with God. We can be born again. We can get back what Adam lost. Now, it's not a physical, natural garden. However, there is coming a time when this creation will also be redeemed back to that precursed state, redeemed back to a glorious eternal state. That's coming out in the future. But in the meantime, our relationship with God is redeemed back. It's there. We got it. And so this morning... What I'm calling this is the garden perspective. I'm going to take some things that we kind of know or are familiar with, and I just want to challenge our thinking this morning to kind of see life, see our Christian experience, see our Christian walk from this garden perspective. This is why Jesus came. He came to restore that cool of the day fellowship walk with the Lord. He came to restore the cool stuff that God wants to do with you in your life. Things that he has just for you. God ordained Adam to name the animals. God's ordained things for you to do, to say. And what I want to do again is just kind of look at living for God from the garden perspective. Because I think sometimes we almost accidentally, religiously compartmentalize some things and get a little intimidated by some of our own beliefs if we don't see them in the broader perspective of God's desire to just walk with us, to live with us. So I'm simply calling this the garden perspective. We're going to just take a, a fresh look at a couple things. First of all, I want to take a look at the spiritual side. I'll just call the spiritual side of this um, garden perspective. Um, the scripture says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if we walk in the light, and these are just a kind of a mishmash of a few different scriptures, but they, they go together. They're talking along the same lines here from Galatians, 1 John, and Romans. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We see this amazing concept in the New Testament. It's like this one-size-fits-all answer to everything we struggle with that just says, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
I mean, if you've been a Christian for a while, you've probably heard this. You've probably heard this thought, this teaching. And there is something in this truth, in this walking in the spirit truth, that I am just coming back to more and more and more. Instead of seeing myself just walking in the Spirit, i got to begin to see myself walking in the Spirit in, this, in, the, in the newness of life. It's a different kind of a thing. When you picture Adam and Eve in the garden, what do you see? I see, and this is pre-fall stuff, I see him, this is, Again, they're walking in the cool of the day. This was the good time when they hadn't eaten the fruit, and they are walking in the cool of the day with, with God. I, I see him smiling. I see him laughing. I see God pointing and talking. I see them listening and hanging out. I see them talking to him and him talking to them. I see fellowship. I see a joy. I see a peace. That's fellowship with God. I don't see them when they're coming in the cool of the day. I don't see them walking on eggshells and just, you know, trying to dot every I and cross every T. There's no fear at that point because there's no sin. Kind of pulling something back from a few weeks ago. This is no condemnation. If righteousness doesn't mean no condemnation, then we're back stuck in the garden again. Righteousness has to mean no condemnation. We've got to be able to walk with God as a work in progress with no condemnation. If we don't, if we can't, again, I, let's take a few thoughts here. we got the thought, okay, I'm saved by grace through faith. I'm forgiven. The blood cleanses from all unrighteousness. It cleanses me from all sin. I got that. Okay. And now over here, I'm trying to walk and I'm trying to live for God. I'm going to walk in the Spirit and live for God. And if we're not careful... We can do the same thing with the Spirit that we do with the law. I know to not walk in the letter of the law, but you can get over here and begin to try to walk in the letter of the law of the Spirit of life. You can make a letter out of it. And you're trying to dot every I and cross every T, and you're kind of tricking yourself back over into a law-based mentality again. Righteousness means right standing with God. Righteousness means I can walk with God. I can walk with God without a sense of shame. In other words, when he says, where are you, Ed? I can say, I'm here. I still have parts of my mind that need to be renewed. I still have weights and sins that easily beset me. I still have things that I'm learning and growing I don't know. I'm imperfect, and yet I have perfect fellowship with God. When I'm seeing these phrases, I'm seeing a garden fellowship with the Lord. When I'm thinking walk in the Spirit, yes, I got great precious promises. Yes, I declare things. Yes, I walk by faith and I'm declaring the word over things. And I'm, I, I understand that. The word of faith. I come from a word of faith school, a word of faith background. I get it. I understand that. But what I'm saying is I'm feeling challenged to a broader context of all that. That's all true. Nothing's changed. But we're doing it from a place of fellowship with God. Righteousness means something. It means I can walk with God in the cool of the day again. It means I'm not perfect, and yet I have peace with God. I can work out my salvation. I can walk through things. I can work through things. Here's the um, great scripture that kind of ties it together for me. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the victory. What do I believe when I believe that Jesus is the Son of God? I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe that I'm saved by grace through faith. I believe that the gift of righteousness is a gift. I receive it as a gift. I overcome because I'm walking in a gift of righteousness. I'm walking from a place of faith. I'm walking from a place of faith in the victory that Jesus Christ won for me. I want you to get a spirit of wisdom and revelation this morning as I'm talking. This is a place. What am I talking about this morning? The garden perspective. Seeing our Christian walk from this place of a walk with the Lord, 
a walk from the cool of the day. In other words, everything now is oriented around that walk. Here's where we can get off in what I call the letter of the Spirit. I quote that. I've got my love walk, got my victory walk, got my peace walk, got all these walks, and I got the, the sword of the Spirit, I'm in the battle, I got the spiritual battle, this is all good, it's all right, and I got all these things that I'm doing, and I'm kind of trying to, you know, get free from this fear, get free from this addiction, get free from this thing, and this is what I'm trying to do to get free from, and I've got the, my great and precious Bible promises, I'm walking by faith and all that stuff, and I'm doing that, but I'm not doing it from a place. I'm doing these things, and this is what I'm saying, it's a nuance. Listen, there's no change in theology here. I'm just saying there's a change from perspective I got to be doing it from a place. I'm overcoming fear, yeah, but I'm doing it from a, from a place of righteousness. I'm doing it from a place of, of, I got fellowship with God again. I got that. I'm over, trying to come over this diction, but I got fellowship. I'm with him. He's walking with me. He knows me intimately. He knows the things that I got to overcome, but I, I got this place in him. I'm doing things from a place. I'm doing things from a place of victory. What if the victory wasn't not having that fear, not having that addiction, having that mean? What if the victory was just having the fellowship with God? What if that was the victory? What if the victory is I can walk with God? And from this place, yeah, I'll overcome that stuff. He'll cause me to triumph in that, but I got the victory before he ever causes me to triumph over those things. So there's just a place. There's a garden perspective. What Jesus did on that cross, he didn't die on that cross so I could have a devotion time. He died on that cross so that I could walk in a place with him, a victory. I just feel challenged. Like I said, I feel stuck in the garden. It's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a good place to be stuck, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, before the fall, God redeemed us back to that. There was a first Adam through whom sin entered the world, but then there's the last Adam. Praise God, who redeemed us from that sin. And we got to remember that we don't have to live under the shame of the first Adam, but we live under the victory of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Yes, I believe in righteousness. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, but it's got to do something for me. Man, if the blood of Christ can't cleanse my conscience from dead works, I'm still stuck. I got to, by faith, say, here I am. Because God has done something in me. I'm a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all has become new. And that's great. And I'm glad for what God has done in me. He's given me the gift of righteousness. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. These are all the in Christ, in Him, in whom truths that are real right now. But the reason that I have right standing with God is because the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ, where my sin abounded, His grace is much more abounded. He's given me a gift of righteousness. So when I come before that throne of grace and I receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness, all that's left is righteousness in my fellowship with God. Again, I'm not perfect, but we've got to allow ourselves to go there. This is what the scripture says. Again, we, we saw that in verse, 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, what does that mean? Does that mean we walk in sinless perfection? Does that mean that we walk absolutely perfect and pure and holy as God? If that's true, then we could never have fellowship one with another. What am I walking in the light of? I'm walking in the light of the light that I have. I'm walking in the light of the light that I know. And sometimes you have a light that says, yeah, there's an area there, Lord. Got to wait and sin that easily besets me. Let's talk together. Let's walk in the cool of the day and talk about that. I get that fear, that old narrative that seems to keep on cropping up. I know he that's in me is greater than that. I really need just some help and guidance in overcoming that. I know there's spiritual weapons, I know there's promises, I know the stuff, but let, let's, let's, how do I do that? You know, help me to, to walk through that. I just want, you know, I just want to know, Father God, just how to better do that. I got to be able to learn there's a fellowship here. There's a dialogue here. The principles are still in place and we're not un undermining them, but if we just go to the principles without that, we can get into a letter of the Spirit 
without the fellowship, the garden thing that God brought back for us. So there's a garden perspective that we can't lose sight of. What if? What if just walking in fellowship was the victory? What if that was the victory? What if just enjoying the cool of the day with the Lord, you still have some weights and sins to overcome, you still have part of your mind that isn't perfectly renewed yet. The Apostle Paul himself said, hey, I'm not perfected, I haven't arrived, but I'm forgetting those things that are behind, I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And he didn't do it with a guilty conscience. He did it with a clear, blood-washed conscience, even though he had more perfecting to be done. The Bible says Jesus is the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. Well, he's in the process of perfecting us. We got to be able to walk with him while he's perfecting us. What am I saying? We got to give ourselves permission to enjoy cool the day fellowship with God, even though we're still growing. We got to be able to have that. That is the essence of righteousness. It's not just an accounting for sin. God didn't just die for the sins of the world for the sake of dying for the sins of the world. He died for the sins of the world for the sake of getting man back in the garden to where he could walk in the cool of the day with him. That was the whole purpose. If you, again, you got a forgiveness religion that doesn't touch your conscience, you don't got much in terms of walking with God. You got to let it touch your conscience. You got to let it. You got to let that blood cleanse your conscience from those dead works. There's a garden perspective here where we go back with him. I begin to walk with God. My life isn't about the weights and the sins that so easily beset me. My life is about walking with him. Amen. And he can deal with me. And he'll show me what I need to do about those weights and sins that so easily beset me. You know, he'll give me victory over those things. But what is this? It's walking in the Spirit. Why is it that when you walk in the Spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh? Why is that? Why does it work that way? Because when you're walking in the Spirit, you're just trying to do one thing. You're not trying to dot all the I's and cross all the T's of the things. that You're just trying to walk in fellowship with God. God, I just want to walk with you. I just want to walk in, that's it. That's my goal. Jesus, you did all that you did so that I could walk in fellowship with God. Yes, there's going to be a perfecting along the way. But the light that I walk in today is different than the light that I had 10 years ago. And the light that I'm walking in today is going to be different than the light that I have 10 years from now. So it's not about somebody else's perfection. It's about my sweet heavenly father showing me the light that I'm accountable for. And he shines some things on your light and your path. Praise God. That's all right. You know, in fact, the Bible says if you're successful, if you do this right and you bear fruit for the kingdom of God, he's going to prune you so that you can bear more fruit. So you got to be willing to let that light shine on some things without guilt or condemnation. Say, oh yeah, cool. I want to get rid of that and bear more fruit. It's a walk, isn't it? It's not a letter of the Spirit thing that you can get into with the promises and all that, and the warfare and all that kind of stuff. You can just kind of, oh, you can feel that heaviness. It's there. It's true. I boldly declare, yes, in the name of Jesus, I declare I, my needs are met according to his riches and glory. He that is in me is greater than he that's in the world. But what do I mean? I'm submitting first to God. Then I resist the devil and he flees from me. There is a place from which I'm doing this walk of faith. I'm not doing it for God. I'm doing it with God. I'm doing it as a walk with Him. So my goal and objective of life is not overcoming that. My orientation, the center of my universe is just simply fellowship with Him. That's it. I remember in, in, in school, uh, one of the teachers said she ran into this young lady who had all these problems. She thought, oh my goodness. I mean, all this horrible past stuff. And she said, I, how can I help this person, Lord? You know, I haven't even, you know, lived long enough to even understand the stuff that she's gone through and been through. Lord, help me, you know, and she's, she's the minister and she's supposed to be helping her. And the Lord just spoke one thing to her spirit. He said, just get her to the throne of grace and I'll take it from there. <laughs> just get her to that place that I love her, that I'm with her, that I'm for her. I'll take it from there. I'll do the heavy lifting. That's a good word. I never forgot that. And sometimes we need that word too. What do we do? Just, just come to the throne of grace and let's take it from there. Let's just get back on talking terms. Let's just get back to where we're talking. You don't have to overcome that weight and sin to be able to talk again. It's the blood that gives you the right to talk again. Can't get the car before the horse again, like we said. My, his blood cleanses my conscience so that I can serve the living God. But if I try to serve the living God for a cleansed conscience, I'll never get there. I got to receive it by grace through faith 
so that I can serve it, so that I can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony, so that I can have that victory. The victory that overcomes the world is our faith. It's the faith in what Jesus Christ did for us. It's a faith in that God-given, blessed um, walk that we have with God. So there's a different perspective. You know, there's just a perspective that this fellowship with God is my victory. I can have it. The other side of this, too, is... um, this, um, 1 John, this is 1 John 3. For if our heart condemns us, God's greater than our heart. He knows all things. Beloved, if our heart doesn't condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Whatever we ask, we receive it from him because we keep his commandments to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. That is the things that we got. We come before the Lord. We believe on his name, Jesus. And when you're walking in fellowship with God and say, okay, Lord, we're on talking terms again. You, you find out right away, and this, this is of Ephesians 4, 29, 30, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edification, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When you're walking in that place of the Spirit with God, and I love you, and all of a sudden you're, you, you sense that pull to just want to lash out or kind of go left, right, you sense the Holy Spirit drawing you back. So, you know, come back to love. Come back to love. Come back to mercy. There is something about it. You can't keep track in your mind of forgiveness and all that stuff. Forget that. Nobody's that good. Nobody's that noble. Nobody's that high. The way you keep track of not being in bitterness is by walking in fellowship with God. Lord, I love you. I praise you. I walk in my fellowship with you. If things begin to pull you out, you begin to realize, nope, that's not God. By faith, nope, that's not God. Lord, I'm staying in the spirit. I'm walking in the spirit. And Lord, yeah, what about that? What am I talking about here? This is where we pull in our fellowship with God. And if I begin to get pulled off, say, Lord, that, that did happen. That was wrong. That shouldn't have happened. The Lord said, yes, just forgive that, even as I have forgiven you. Forgive that. When you're walking in a place of fellowship and his spirit reminds you of things, reminds you of the scripture, oh, yes, that's right. Okay, there's a fellowship walk with God. In other words, you can receive things different then even a pastor on a Sunday morning saying, remember this, this, then when you are just endeavoring to walk with spirit and you hear the spirit of God tell you, the spirit of God reminds you of that scripture. Oh yeah, that's you, Lord. Okay, here we go. I'm just gonna walk with you, Father God. Help my attitude, help it, but I'm gonna walk with you. There's that heart, that, that desire to just walk with him. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It is in not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here's the other cool thing about walking with God. In, from a place of fellowship. Because a lot of times we think of this, what's God's plan for my life? What's his call? You know, when think of Jesus when he came to this earth, he had a lot of things to do. He came to destroy the power of the devil. He came to pay the penalty for sin. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He came to bear witness to the truth. He came to do all these different things. He came to fulfill the scriptures. But you'll notice he didn't come and just kind of check, 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 check. He just came and had a walk with the Father. In other words, what Jesus modeled for us was that garden walk. He just said what he heard the Father say. He did what he saw the Father do. He said, I don't do anything of my own accord. I don't do anything of my own will. I'm just doing what he shows me to do. And so that's what he did. That's how he flowed. That's how he rolled with it. He just literally said what he heard the Father say, did what he saw the Father do. Because here's another thing. When you're trying to do things for God and live for God, in the same way you can get all technical, a letter of the law of the Spirit about overcoming stuff, you can get all letter of the law about trying to have to do all this stuff for God. Jesus didn't do that way either. Everything came from, whether it's overcoming stuff or whether it's you're doing stuff for God, you're doing it from a place of fellowship. I'm just walking, hey, Lord, you've shown me some things. You know, like I told you, even the start of the door of life, I knew out ahead that I was going to be part of a church someday and starting up a new work. And that family member said, hey, and maybe, you know, what about that? I said, yeah, it's out there. And he said, maybe now is the time. And when he said, maybe now is the time, the Holy Spirit just said, now is the time. You know, but I was just walking along and that came and I got that. But we can, as we're living for God and wanting to serve God, it's that same heart, that same attitude. Lord, I see that out there in my future. Is now the time? Do you have something else you want me to do? Show me what you want me to do. You'll see that we're as workmanship, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should not check them off, but walk in them. So in the same way, the pressure's off 
to have to be perfect to have fellowship. The pressure's off to have to be doing everything just right in his plan for my life to have fellowship too. I'm going to walk them out. And you know what? If you're walking in fellowship with God, it is your best protection. Walking in fellowship with God is your best protection from not missing it. Because even though we miss it, we all do, when we walk in fellowship with God, his spirit just has a way of getting us right back on track. You know, the classic um, map navigator thing, you get off, you take the wrong turn, it'll get you right back on track. Fellowship has that rerouting way of doing it. I'm not rerouting myself. I'm just getting back on fellowship with God. And as I'm back on fellowship with God, he reroutes me. My best protection to staying in the will of God for my life, to doing what he wants me to do. When I'm frustrated with the weights and the sins that's who he's leaving set me, I'm going to get back, humble myself under his mighty hand and just receive that forgiveness, that mercy, and that grace that he has for my life. So, um, and then I'm just going to just talk about just the practical side. If you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Um, how do you do this? This sounds really cool. Sounds really flowery. Walking with God, walking in fellowship with God. The concept is awesome. How do I get there in real life? This is just the practical side. You'll notice one thing. Um, the practical side of it isn't really emotionally that exciting. If you are raised with Christ, which we were, seek those things where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. The way you get there, the way you get in the sweet place of fellowship with God, it is purely an act of faith where you're beginning to set your mind on things above. You don't have to wait for anything. You don't have to wait for any kind of special leading or guiding. It is just, it's a simple act. And these are some of the things that you do. Um, this is what we would call our devotion time. This would, be, this would be something we'd have in the morning. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Give and thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So what is this saying? We're having a time of letting that word dwell in us richly. We're singing. We're not worrying about stuff. We're praying about things. This is kind of the stuff that would happen in that devotion time, okay? And I just want to give you a, a few little quick practical things about this. Because like we said, Jesus didn't die just so we could have a devotion time. But a devotion time has a very important value. There were customs that you can see throughout the New Testament that Jesus did, that Paul did, that were customs of faith and godliness. And I'll tell you, a devotion time, that regular time with the Lord, is one of the powerful ways that we do it. Um, and, I, and, and if you've got your devotion time and you've got your thing figured out and you're awesome, great, good. I'm just talking for anybody who might be struggling with how to do this thing called the devotion time, all right? Here's just some things I've learned through the years that have helped me. Um, first of all, um, get yourself a Bible that is very friendly for you to read. Something that is not going to cause you to get lost in the these and the thous. Something that when you read it, you can read it and it's comfortable for your vocabulary, your understanding. And another thing that I like to do, again, this is personal, I, get a, I like to get a big Bible. You know, I do the reading off my phone and the digital stuff too. But sometimes when I'm just having my own little place, I'll just get a big Bible. You know, it doesn't be huge. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> it's kind of big. I like big letters. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or whatever, but... Is the age thing? I don't know. I've, I like big letters, and um, I like to just not be have these. I mean, the, the most you know, the only goal that I set again. This is personal. I'm just seeing personal stuff. You can take what bears witness, what helps. But I really, really just endeavor to read a chapter a day, in terms of a devotional time. Now, as a pastor, as a minister, I study a lot in the Bible and the Word and all that stuff. But that doesn't count. You understand? I can spend four hours, five hours preparing. To do that. that doesn't count. That's not garden time. I get good stuff. God speaks to me. But there is garden time stuff. They teach us that in Bible school right away. That doesn't count, guys. You got to have your personal time with the Lord. You got to have your personal time with Jesus. We all need that. And you got to make it easy. This is cool of the day, garden stuff. When we hear God coming, we shouldn't be running the other way. 
We got, we're redeemed. We're living under the second Adam, not the first Adam. We don't have to run away. We run to him. Even when we sin, we come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help. Why? Because second Adam, Jesus, or last Adam, Jesus, he did it. So that's the way it is with our devotion time. So I make that, that devotion time, for lack of a better phrase, um, something inviting. You know, big Bible. I like the big letters. I'm going for one chapter. That's really my, my, this time that I'm going to have to start. Now, it doesn't always stay with one chapter. I might go on more, go on less. But what if I miss a devotion time? Is God mad at me? Shame. I'm not saved by my devotion time. No. Yeah, you got to read twice as much tomorrow. Catch up on all your reading. You read twice as fast and check that box and God likes you again. Oh. I'm just saying this is, that is the way we think. It is, isn't it? And this is why it can be such a drudge. And this is why I'm just feeling called back to the garden. We're doing, that's good stuff to do, but we're just doing it from a place. We're doing it from a place of the victory's won. The battle's over. Conscience is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So I'm doing that. And you know, for me, this is kind of what I'll do. Maybe because I'm a pastor, I don't know. But I think of a devotion time as, and as think of it as a mini church service. It's your own little structured time. You know, when we come in on the Sunday morning, you know, we got into these depths of the glory during praise and worship, but we didn't come in like that. We had to set our mind, didn't we? David prayed. We had some fellowship. David prayed. We worshiped. We had some uh, prophetic word. And now we're having the ministry of the word. But what is it? There's a diligence. You're setting your mind. Are you getting some stuff in the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit showing you stuff? Yeah, but before the Holy Spirit is even showing you stuff, now something happened before. You had to get up. You had to come here. You had to set your mind. You had to do some really natural stuff and things. And then God did that and he took part with it. And you, you're getting things, but all the cool stuff that you're getting and all that stuff that you're getting that, that's from God and is good, you got to realize that Man, he loves you. He gave himself for you. All that cool stuff you're experiencing is not God's love for you. That while God loves me, I'm feeling God and I'm feeling the Spirit. He loved you while you were a sinner. He loved you. You're getting fed. You're eating. You're experiencing the strength of the Holy Spirit. You're dialoguing. You're gardening with God. You're experiencing fellowship with God. You're getting that second sermon of the Holy Spirit. You go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're experiencing this. Yeah, it's connected to the love of God. But your sense of approval or your sense that God loves you is purely through Jesus. What you're enjoying here is just a fellowship walk with God. So when I have that little devotion time, I just kind of do that. I'll just say, okay, I'm just going to open the little devotion time with prayer. All right? And then singing. A lot of times I have a little playlist on my phone, and I'll listen to a song or two, you know, or whatever. No rules. I can listen to songs the whole time if I want to. All right? All right? No hard words. I'm just saying there's a basic structure that just helps me. Get in the Spirit. The Spirit's already in me. I'm just getting in the Spirit. I'm setting my mind on things above. I'm letting that word dwell in me richly. And then after I'll play that song or sing along or whatever I do, then I'll have a time where I'm reading the Word of God, reading whatever that chapter of the day might be. And I can have something to, you know, write notes or get that second sermon in your devotion time as you're getting stuff, you know? And that's really it. And I say, thank you, Lord. And this is where you have that little time of prayer where you're kind of, um, I, I kind of like to think of it, inhaling and exhaling. You know, you kind of inhale the Spirit of God, the presence of God, and then when you're exhaling, you're kind of getting that stuff off your chest, the, the worries and things. Okay, what are the things that are out in my front of my day today? Okay, all right, we're gardening it. I'm just, Lord, what about this, this, that? I'm casting the care of that over on you, praise God. I'm going to go out with my day without that care on me, you know, and that's really what it is. So it's basically, when you think of a, a devotion time, it's like a mini church service, and you're the worship leader, and you're the pastor, and you dismiss yourself when you're done, <laughs> all right? And it's you, and whatever you want that to be, and it won't have to be the same for every day, you know? It can be whatever you want it to be. I'm just saying if you're struggling for a structure, if you're trying to figure out how to get started, it's not a big, Jesus did all the heavy lifting, all right? He did the heavy lifting. He, he paid the price for sin. All we're doing, again, is we're just getting in this, we're setting our mind on things above. We're doing that stuff where we're allowing the Spirit of God to begin to work with us, in us. But there's a practical side to this. You see brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, and they're in the clouds, and they're in the glory, and they're doing all those things. I can tell you what about them. They're just having a time of setting their mind on things above. Just give the Spirit of God something to work with, to speak to, to be able to minister. You're just giving that sacrifice. You're just giving God that attention, you know? But here's the cool thing, and this is where I just really want to tie this all back. 
Because I remember I'd, I'd read through the Bible and feeling pretty good about my devotion time. And then you come across this scripture. Be joyful always. Never stop praying. <laughs> <sighs> Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you who belong in Christ Jesus. This is how you can tell where you're coming from in your devotion time. If this scripture, if you feel crushed under the weight of this scripture, <laughs> you need to understand, again, Jesus didn't just die on the cross so he could have that little morning devotion time. He died on the cross so you can walk with him. This is not a picture of your morning devotion time. This is a picture of you and God walking throughout your day. In other words, my little devotion time's done. That means, oh, I only had done so much scripture. Eh, I just got started, all right? My devotion time is the start of my day. It's the start of my walk with God. And then when I go from that devotion time, it's like, oh, see that? I'm talking, you know, people might look at me and think I'm talking to myself. I'm not talking to myself. I'm talking, but I'm talking to God. I'm praying always. I'm acknowledging Him. Pray isn't just, you can't get that picture of prayer, all right? Prayer is just talking from your heart. It's talking to God. I don't believe that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were on their knees folding their hands, talking to the heavenly Father. They were walking in the cool of the day. They're walking. They're moving. They're praying, praying, just communicating fellowship with God. So think of prayer out of that religious construct into fellowship with God. That's what prayer is. It's just fellowship with God. It's the cool of the day. It's restored. So praying always isn't intimidating anymore. It just reminds me then that God's always with, with me. Not just when I'm feeling him in my morning devotion time, but that I'm walking with him. That my non-devotion time time is also my walk with God. Just as much. It's got to be. This is what made, I mean, this is what makes this make sense. Even when I walk in the darkest valley, I won't be afraid for you're close by my side. You rod your staff, protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me with, by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Why does this guy not get worried in the dark place? Because he's there. In other words, no matter where I am in my day, he is with me. He's just with me all the time loves me just as much all the time, and he will, you will have second sermons all throughout your day God can give you. You don't have to be in a place of worship and praise in a, this, this perfect atmosphere. We want this atmosphere. The Bible says, come, especially as you see the day approaching. We need this atmosphere. We need fellowship. We need it. If you'll notice, Door of Life is very much by design. You come in there. You, en you enjoy some fellowship through the doors. We get into praise and worship. We'll flow in the Spirit. We'll have a little more time of fellowship. Then we get into the Word of God. It's not a bunch of church politics and different things. We do this and all. It's, it's Jesus. It's about the Spirit of God. It's about getting in the Spirit. That's what we want to do on a Sunday morning. And again, think of this as a little model that you can look at, you know, and then see what God does. You, we, did, we all came here, we came here this morning by faith that God was going to show up and speak to your heart, that God was going to move. You got stuff today. You didn't know what you were going to get here today before you got here. You just came here today and you set your mind on things above in a lot of different ways and God showed up. But what are we doing? It Again, not from a sense of religious duty, but we're doing it from a garden perspective. There's a spiritual side to this thing. We just got to, by faith, believe Jesus did that heavy lifting. Yes, I want to overcome the weights and sins. Yes, I want to walk in all the good things he's ordained me to walk in. But none of those things are the center of my universe. The center of my universe is fellowship with God. Do you know the center of Jesus' universe wasn't even dying on the cross for our sins. It wasn't healing that blind person. It wasn't raising that dead person. The center of Jesus' universe was, I say what I hear the Father say, I do what I see the Father do. I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This was along the, the path. We saw it in Gethsemane. He said, Father, if it is possible, let that cup pass from me. But because it was the Father's will, then he did it because it was the Father's will. He was just dialed in. The center of Jesus' universe was the Father. It was fellowship with the Father. He said what he heard. He did what he saw. That's fellowship. He got all the boxes checked, tempted in all points without sin, because he perfectly walked in fellowship. And we have that promise. If we walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We'll walk in the good works he's ordained us to walk in. So nothing new here in terms of theology, but perspective, context. We're doing what we're doing. We're living what we're living from a place of the garden, that place of fellowship with him. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning.
And I just pray, Lord, for that spirit of wisdom and revelation that just really take the essence of what you're trying to speak, Lord, that you just want to hang out with your children. You just want to hang out and love on them. You want to hang out and talk with them. You want them to not be afraid to talk with you about the stuff you already know. Lord, we just pray that there would just be a sweet fragrance and refreshing of your presence, Lord, that just comes in this place this morning in a way that just loosens all of us up spiritually to realize Jesus did it. It's his victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world. It's our faith. It's because we can walk in this place with you that we can overcome everything that comes against us. Go ahead and make this a declaration of faith if your heart can agree. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, you're a good father. I just want to walk with you. I just want to experience your presence. Help me to remember I never need to run from your presence. I can always run into your presence. Your mercy is there. Your grace is there. Your voice is there. I love you, Jesus. Here is my life, fresh and anew. I purpose this day that my Christian experience is about one thing, walking with you, saying what I hear, seeing what I do, and enjoying my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That was one of his, his points. He came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. That we could have and enjoy that life more abundantly. So what am I saying kind of in a, maybe in an Aaron Rodgers kind of way, relax, loosen up. It's okay. Yeah, God knows there's some I's the dot and some T's the crosses and some different things, but he wants to do it with you. He wants you to let him in on that part of your frustration. He wants you to let him in on that anger and the hatred and the frustrations or the addictions or the things. That he wants you to say, come on. I came here to walk with you. You're not doing this for me. Jesus beat it so that you could walk with me and overcome that. This is the victory that overcomes the world, not your consecration. It's your faith. It's your faith in what he did for you. Bring it back to the garden. Walk with me. Praise God. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still in the roses and I hear the voice and I hear in the voice I hear falling on my ear the son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none has ever known. I think it just captures the heart and the essence of what God wants for us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God.